Hi, I'm LaVon Roberson, your host here at What's the 411. I cover books, art, and culture for What's the 411. And here you are now with the Bookish Report. Tonight I have my guest. Her name is Nina Cruz. She's the author and illustrator of 14 books. So we're going to be talking tonight with Nina Cruz about her latest book. It's called Seeing Into Tomorrow, Haiku by Richard Wright. Welcome, and thank you so much for being at the Bookish Report. Oh, thank you so much for having me here. You bet. Now listen, I want to frame our conversation tonight with one thing, and that is, who knew that Richard Wright, the author we think of, you know, Black Boy, his memoir for fiction, or um, Native Son, nonfiction, we think of Richard Wright as a major nonfiction and fiction writer. What is this about haiku? What, what is this about? I'm so surprised. I know. Well, I was totally surprised when I found them and read them myself and thought, well, that is a curious thing that he would write any. And I first found about six in a collection that I had a book that I had an anthology of, of African-American poetry. And then I said, oh, well, that's interesting. And I read in the back and I saw that they came out of a larger collection and ordered that book and found that there was a published um, collection of about 800 haiku. Oh, my. So, not only did he write them, but he wrote a <laughs> lot of them. <laughs> and those 800, as I read through that book, I found out were out of a collection of 4,000 that he wrote. These were the 800 that made the cut. So that's, that's a amazing. lot of haiku. That's a lot. 4,000 haiku. 4,000 haiku. So you and I sort of did the math before we came on camera, and we figured out, well, you figured out because you're the mathematician, that that would be about what did you say? Oh, I think we figured it was about seven or eight a day because he wrote these haiku, these four thousand haiku, over eighteen months, the last eighteen months of his life, in fact. So, around eight or nine a day, I'd say probably. That's amazing because that would be probably most of the waking hour because you're only awake really for about twelve hours or so. Right. Yeah. Right. So he was doing a lot of writing. Now, at that time. Um, were you able to think of him when you discovered this as also being not only a 20th century writer, like one of the most important writers, but also a major poet? Or would you say this was some sort of anomaly? How would you frame it for us? Well, I don't think he's as well known, obviously, for his poetry, but these are not the only poems that he wrote. And in fact, when I first was writing out a draft of the book and we um, to get permission to use the poems, we had to send that draft to his daughter, Julia Wright, and I had written something about him being famous for novels, essays, plays, mm -hmm. and she said, don't forget to call him a poet as well, which I was like, no, well, yes, that is true, in fact, and these are, you know, quite a major piece of work that he did, but he did other poems aside from this piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, that really surprising. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. think most people have a notion of Richard Wright as also being a poet. That is really great for us to know about. Yeah, and it yeah. all came about because of your doing all kinds of research and digging, right. and also being able to then pull from the haiku that you read, 12 haiku to include in your book, Seeing Into Tomorrow, for children. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that because I had another surprise. So a few weeks ago, I went to your book event at City College, which was hosted by, um, is it Robert Shank? Um, Greg Shank. Greg Shank, yes. who's absolutely amazing, does amazing programming over there. So thank you, Greg Shank at City College. And I was really surprised to see that there was a haiku writing table, and even more so that I saw children as young as five years old experimenting and creating haiku. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, the nice thing, um, you'll find there are a number of collections with haiku for children, and I think that in a way it's such an accessible form, while you know, when you read these poems there's such subtlety to them, but mm -hmm. that the form is very simple and very short means that it's something that um, gets brought to children in schools on a regular basis. In fact, I just got an email from a third grade teacher in Wisconsin who's working with this book right now. Oh, how <laughs> so, wonderful. So, you know, so kids do read them and use them because of the, the simplicity, the three lines, and you talk about syllables and beats. These are things, they're concepts. So let's break it down. Fit. A haiku. Yes. What okay. is it? A haiku 
It's a traditional Japanese form of poetry. The idea is that there's three lines to it. The first line has five syllables, five beats. The second line has seven syllables. And the third line has five syllables. That's kind of the general form. So I can promise you there are many exceptions to that rule, as any you know artists mean to break rules very often. Exactly. <laughs> um, but and then also the other ideas around haiku are also that it usually is about the seasons traditionally, mm. about the seasons, about nature. I didn't know that part. Yes, yeah, so and nature and the seasons is often very much a part of what the haiku poem is. Mm. And the third idea of haiku, which I always found most fascinating, is that there's often the idea of the sense of kind of a movement and change mm. is something that's also deeply embedded in the Japanese idea mm. of what haiku are. Mm, movement so, and change. Yeah, and I think Richard Wright manages to capture all of that in his poems. Mm. So. Very interesting. So based on all of that, how did you go about choosing only 12 haiku? Well, for seeing into tomorrow. I had a lot of post-its. I had a lot of choices <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> 12 was not immediate. Um, so as I started thinking about how to create this into a book, a project that I could you know, yeah. sell to a publisher, grow to children, you know, kind of package it properly, I thought a lot about including information about his biography. So mm. early on, I was always thinking about how to tie the biography to the poems in some way. And, you know, which was kind of easy and natural because as I had read through the poems and then reread Black Boy and thought about mm. his writing, I kind of mm. thought, saw how there were these relationships mm. that you could pull. Mm. So that kind of helped direct which poems I would choose. Mm. Also, you know, certain ones just spoke to childhood experiences mm. and kind of everyday life of kids and I thought would really resonate with young children. Mm. You know, I wondered too when I went to that event about not only did you have the haiku creating table, but there was also the um, collage creating table that the children, and there were lots of children and lots of families there, so it was really amazing. They were also working on collages, and I know a signature of all of your work, 14 books, is photographs and photo collages. So talk with me a little bit about your process because you just mentioned about movement and change as being, you know, one of the focus, focal points of haiku. So right. let's see if we can put that together. Right. So can I turn the book around and show a page? I don't know if it'll show up again. Oh yeah, we don't know if it'll show up. Um, so um, I'll put that out like that. So when I worked on um, the images, and I knew that I was going to use collage in some way or form in the images, and what I thought about doing was taking a scene that these, this poem, these children would be in, that was reflected in the, the haiku itself. The haiku on this page is a loud ticking clock, sounds in rhythm with the heat of a long, slow day, mm. and shows a boy sitting on a porch. And um, instead of just taking a, a straight photograph of the boy on the porch, what I did was I took a series of photographs, small images, of pieces of the porch if you went around ah. and chopped the picture up into ah. pieces and then re-collaged those together ah. while taking a picture of the boy separate and combining him in as a oh, separate I collage see. piece. And what that did was it meant that there was some sort of, again, movement mm. as sort of reflected in the idea of what haiku should have, so there was some movement in my image that could reflect the poems. Yeah. yeah. That's really fascinating. It also leads me to think about when you talked about the little boy and the, the photograph. Well, I guess there was a collage of photographs. Yeah. I noticed that in your acknowledgement page, you actually named the names of the little boys who modeled who posed in the photographs in the book. So you named 12, the names of 12 little brown boys. And we don't usually name the models, so I wondered about naming and what that might mean. Um, well, I've, I've always done that, is acknowledged, um, put, put the names of the children and the families in my projects, in my acknowledgments. Um, for me, you know, the projects are off, it's about kind of a collaboration, in fact, in a certain level of the work that I do by using photographs of people in the books, I feel like they are very much part of my collaborative work here. So mm. I feel like they deserve an acknowledgement yeah. and a thank mm. you. So mm. I always try to do that in, in all of the books that I've done. 
And, and I wondered if it was related to naming because I just want to see this piece here. Um, I just want to read this piece. Um, let's see. I think I have it here. Uh, I'll see if I can find it. It's on the page where you do the um, biography. And you say, Richard grew up in a time and a place when many people said that brown little boys like him didn't grow up to be famous writers, but he did. Richard wrote stories, novels, essays, plays, and poems known all over the world. And I would guess that one of the first words he wrote was his name. So I wondered if there was some connection between, you know, you're focusing on little brown and black boys in the book, you make sure to name them, and then your very first page of your book is about naming and, and writing your name. I, I thought that was so beautifully crafted, Nina. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Nice. yeah, well I also wanted to tie that to that the first um, poem that we have in here, which says, just enough of snow for a boy's finger to write his name mm. on the porch. Mm. You know, so there's also a haiku with that. There's a haiku yeah. that ties to that as That's well. That's wonderful. You know, and I think, you know, and for any child, that is one of the first things they do learn to write is their name. And there's some, you know, a great deal of power in great, getting that, that control of over sort of this idea of these words and this sort of this thing that you can do, this writing, right? That's and right. that's where they begin. That's right. And so, you and know, identity. Identity. Like, oh, this is me uniquely because my name is Nina. My exactly. name's Lavon. My name is Tom. My name is Derek. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So that naming and 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 creating and creating is being part of that sort of naming and mm. ownership. And I wanted to get that across mm. in in the book as sort of an idea about kind of that this there's this possibility of using something oh. like haiku. Any child could use it to name and to own and to take their world and claim it. I, that's right, claim it, create it. Create it, Which yeah. is what they had a chance to do with the book event, which right. I thought was just really amazing. So what's your favorite haiku in Seeing Into Tomorrow, your book? Do you have a favorite one in there? I'm a terrible favorite, <laughs> I never have a favorite. I have, um, I always have many favorites. Um, it's like, I don't have a favorite color. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, what was nice about having so many poems to choose from, you know, 800, meant that I could really kind of have all these different moods within mm. one piece of work, which mm. is really fun, you know, if you've only written 10 of them, it might have all felt kind of the same. Yeah. Well, I actually have a favorite. Oh, okay. And as you can imagine, it is where you take the title from. I love this haiku. And you read it much better than I do. Okay. Could you read that one? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's my favorite. A spring sky so clear that you feel you are seeing into tomorrow. Would you mind reading it again? You, you're okay. such a real, you really read well. A spring sky so clear that you feel you are seeing into tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm. It's really beautiful haiku and it's not, it's not um, an art form, I have to be honest, mm -hmm. that I was the least bit attracted to. Okay. So you've definitely made a believer out of me, and I'm sure that if that's the case, and I love what you said, it'll happen for young children for the very reasons that you were talking about before, having a sense of you can create this, having the, the understanding that it is this form that is, quote, simple, but when you try it, not so much so. We'll right. talk about that later. <laughs> So I have another discovery, another surprise, um, and um, that is how the book shows from the very first page these sheets of paper. Mm -hmm. First, there's a typewriter out in nature on a fallen tree, log of a tree, and then there, throughout the pages, they are sheets of white sheets of paper, except on the pages where there's the haiku. But running throughout the rest of the book, there are these sheets of typewritten pages with words on them. And I tried to read them. It was only later on in the book that I actually could read the haiku that's on them. Right. What's going, I mean, I know that it has to be tied to what you were helping me understand before, which was the movement and the change of haiku. Is this just a, this isn't, and it, it way through imagery to do it or? 
Well, that actually grew out of um, one of the things I read in um, Julia Wright's introduction to the book uh, of the larger book of haiku. The one with 817 haiku in it? Exactly that one. <laughs> and she talks about how, one, she talked about how he encur would encourage her to write them, but he also, ah. she also talked about how he would, ha she said, hang them like laundry on a line. So he'd have a, ah. a string up in his office and he'd hang them up on little pegs and have the haiku there. And, you know, that was my imagination of what that would look like. Like, you'd have each of them as, like, each individual sheet. And I kind of, so I had in my mind this process of him, you know, in this farmhouse in France where he was writing at the time, mm. hanging up his haiku, and then, you know, the wind breeze comes and blows a few <laughs> across the floor or whatever. You know, I just feel like, so those really just grew out of my kind of sort of, thinking and imagining what that was and you know which is also one of the fun things about yeah. putting the book together was kind of imagining this world yeah. that he might have inhabited. Yeah. And since you did the math that was like seven haiku a day. Yeah. yeah. A lot of uh, haiku in that room mm -hmm. and that he engaged his daughter and he read his haikus to her, he encouraged her yeah. to write haiku yeah. and that's exactly what you did at your event two weeks ago. Right. It was really thrilling to be there. So I want to talk a little bit because um, it, it lends itself to uh, what you're describing. We just talked about Richard Wright and his relating to his daughter around haiku and engaging her in that process of creativity and right. creation. And so I'm thinking a lot about legacy. The legacy of Richard Wright, which led to this book and people like me will be able to discover haiku for chil in a children's book, um, but also the legacy of a children's illustrator and book author like Donald Cruz, mm -hmm. your father. Right. So I noticed at the book event that you had at the um, collage creating table, there was a freight train. Mm -hmm. Is that some sort of for them to work to create a haiku? I'm sorry, a collage out of that. Is that some sort of homage to your father and his book from 1978, Freight Train? Well, a bit, you know. <laughs> it, you know, so it started. It, it jumped off of the um, the haiku in the book, which yes. includes the freight train. Yes. And a photograph of and, your father. And, my, and so when I read that one, I thought, well, <laughs> I know who I'm asking to be in this picture. Because I just thought that would be an, I thought it would be a nice image. So he's standing with my son, and I thought, oh, that is your son. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is my son, and what I thought was it would be nice to have this. I, you know, if we're going to be at the train tracks, you know, this, I would have him with a child, with a, a, a an adult, right. with a child, with right. an adult, and um, so that was my first thought was to combine those two things together. And then um, when I was thinking about how to thematically link the, the collage to. Um, the event, an easy way to do oh, it would be to have something that didn't have to try to build exactly. what I was doing. But mm. so freight train cars are so different mm. looking and stuff, mm. I thought that might be a fun mm. place to build from for that. But yeah, I mean, and my, my father has definitely given me you know, great, um, a great deal of guidance and inspiration and just been you know, such a terrific supporter for me in terms of my development. And, so know. the legacy of that and, and that you're continuing it. And not just your father, your mother too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Can yeah. you talk so, a little bit about Ann Jonas? About Ann Jonas's yeah. book? Oh yeah. I mean, it was um, really wonderful for me as a um, young adult really, as in my 20s and college and stuff, that my mother was um, working on her books and I would come back home from college and sit and talk with her and she would allow me an opportunity to be with her and talking through how she kind of developed her ideas and that was a really sort of special thing and for both of us because it went both in both yeah, directions yeah. in terms of what it gave us both in, in terms of developing m me, my developing my sense as an artist and, and her kind of deepening our bond I think. You know? so I I also want to say something about that because um, with that legacy mm -hmm. of like your inheritance um, and then your building on it for your son and other children, mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about that legacy, how you might envision it um, for little brown and black boys moving forward in terms of the books that are available for them 
like your book, where they mm -hmm. see each other. Mm -hmm. How can we make that more of a reality for our little, right, right, our little brown and black boys? Because that, that is a legacy that you mm -hmm. certainly. I know I've benefited from having legacy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's it's definitely something that's been talked about a lot, um, particularly of late, in terms of how to increase just the, the numbers of people of color involved in the children's book business. And one of the things that's come up now too is just getting more people involved in editing, and um, mm -hmm. you know, for, you know, mm -hmm. sort of on the product on the publishing yeah, end, yeah, so that. When you know someone walks through the door with a great idea, a writer or an illustrator, and there's somebody there who who gets it, who yeah. sees it, and sees where the market is for that project, so that's one big part of it, I think, for sure. And that's not something we talk about. No, no, yeah. no there, there is, but there is conversations Good. having happening Good. about it. We Good. need diverse books is really well, one yeah. of the groups actively involved in that kind of stuff. We need diverse books is a really big deal. Yeah, for me. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So they've definitely been doing Thank making some headway on that. that one. Okay. And you know. Kwame Alexander has his own imprint now. Yay! Chris Myers has his own imprint now. I think that, you know, some things can happen. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ways uh, that you end your book is that you say here, um, would you like to write haiku? Take a look around you. Use all your senses. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? How do you feel? Have fun. So I want you to know that I took your question seriously. Good. And I tried to write a haiku. Okay. So here it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nina Cruz, for you share Richard's right haiku with all and brown boys. That's my Very attempt to nice. do a haiku. <laughs> So, in closing, I also wanted to give people the opportunity to know that you can find Nina Cruz's book, Seeing Into Tomorrow, Haiku by Richard Wright, in bookstores everywhere. Also online at IndieBound, Barnes & Noble, and Amazon.com. So, um, look in the children's section of your bookstores. Also, to Nina's point about we need diverse books, we also need people to look for, and really, I think you were saying before, dig for these writers, to look for these books. Anything else you'd like to say about that? Well, you know, I think that one of the things we sometimes, it's hard sometimes for a lot of books to end up in the bookstores and to be at the front of that first list of things you look at on Amazon, but there are great librarians in your local library who are going to know a have, and have access to a lot of books you might not otherwise see and even if you read it once there and then buy it and bring it home the, the next day that would be great and also a number of lists and things that people are putting online where they're really highlighting a lot of books that wouldn't necessarily rise to the top of those lists All right. and so the more we find these books and the more we share books by writers of color the more opportunity that the next person's going to have. You're going to lay the groundwork and then they say, oh, well, look, this book we thought nobody was going to buy exactly. it, but a lot of people bought yeah. it. How did that happen? Yeah, how did that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> because someone read it and they said, well, here, here's a great book you're going to want to read with your baby. And here's another, and pass those books around and share them with each other. And if we can build that community, that's going to elevate the whole industry. Well, you're certainly with 14 books. You're helping to give us a lot to read in diverse books. And also, I just wonder, in that vein, what's next for you, Nina Cruz, when it comes to building the community of books? Well, you know, I don't want to talk too much about something that isn't, you know, signed understood, and sealed. Understood. But no jinx. No jinxing <laughs> here, so fingers crossed. But hopefully there will be a, a, another book using some poetry, this time ah. on African-American woman. Oh, we'll for girls. See where that becomes. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. It has been a pleasure, Levon. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being with me.